1. An ambiguity in ordinary speech means something very pronounced, and as a rule, witty or deceitful. I propose to use the word in an extended sense, and shall think relevant to my subject any verbal nuance, however slight, which gives room for alternative reactions to the same piece of language. Sometimes, especially in this first chapter, the word may be stretched absurdly far, but it is descriptive because it suggests the analytical mode of approach, and with that I am concerned. In a sufficiently extended sense, any prose statement could be called ambiguous. In the first place, it can be analyzed. Thus, the brown cat sat on the red mat may be split up into a series. This is a statement about a cat. The cat the statement is about is brown, and so forth. Each such simple statement may be translated into a complicated statement, which employs other terms. Thus, you are now faced with the task of explaining what a cat is, and each such complexity may again be analyzed into a simple series. Thus, each of the things that go to make up a cat will stand in some spatial relation to the mat. Explanation by choice of terms may be carried in any direction the explainer wishes, thus to translate and analyze the notion of sat might involve a course of anatomy. The notion of on, a theory of gravitation. Such a course, however, would be irrelevant, not only to my object in this essay, but to the context implied by the statement, the person to whom it seems to be addressed, and the purpose for which it seems to be addressed to him. Nor would you be finding out anything very fundamental about the sentence by analyzing it in this way. You would merely be making another sentence, stating the same fact, but designed for a different purpose, context, and person. Evidently, the literary critic is much concerned with implications of this last sort, and must regard them as a main part of the meaning. There is a difference. Uh, you may say that between thought and feeling, between the fact stated and the circumstance of the statement, but very often you cannot know one without knowing the other, and an apprehension of the sentence involves both without distinguishing between them. Thus I should consider, as on the same footing, uh, the two facts about this sentence, that it is, a, uh, it is about a cat, and that it is suited to a child. And I should only isolate two of its meanings to form an ambiguity worth notice. It has contradictory associations, which might cause some conflict in the child who heard it, in that it might come out of a fairy tale story, uh, a fairy story, and might come out of reading without tears. In analyzing the statement made by a sentence, having no doubt fixed on this statement by an apprehension of the implications of the sentence, one would continually be dealing with a sort of ambiguity due to metaphors made clear by Mr. Herbert Reed in English prose style, because metaphor more or less far-fetched, more or less complicated, more or less taken for granted so as to be unconscious, is the normal mode of development of a language. Words used as epithets are, are words used to analyze a direct statement, whereas metaphor is the synthesis of several units of observation into one commanding image. It is the expression of a complex idea, not by analysis, nor by direct statement, but by a sudden perception of an object relation. One thing is said to be like another, and they have several different properties in virtue of which they are alike. Evidently this, as a verbal matter, yields more readily to analysis than the social ambiguities I have just considered, and I shall take it as normal to the simplest type of ambiguity, which I am considering in this chapter. The fundamental situation, whether it deserves to be called ambiguous or not, is that a word or a grammatical structure is effective in several ways at once. To take a famous example, there is no pun, double syntax, or dubiety in, of feeling in bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. 
But the comparison holds for many reasons. Because ruined monastery choirs are places in which to sing, because they involve sitting in a row, because they are made of wood, are carved into knots, and so forth. Because they used to be surrounded by a sheltering building crystallized out of the, of the likeness of a forest, and colored with stained glass and painting like flowers and leaves, because they are now abandoned by all but the gray walls colored like the skies of winter, because the cold and narcissistic charm suggested by choir boys suits well with Shakespeare's feeling for the object of the sonnets, and for so various sociological and historical reasons, the Protestant destruction of monasteries, fear of Puritanism, uh, Puritanism, which it would be hard now to trace out in their proportions. These reasons and many more relating to the simile, relating the simile to its place in the sonnet, must all combine to give the line its beauty, and there is a sort of ambiguity in not knowing which of them to hold most clearly in mind. Clearly this is involved in all such written richness and heightening of effects, and the machinations of ambiguity are among the very roots of poetry. Such a definition of the first type of ambiguity covers almost everything of literary importance, and this chapter ought to be my longest and most illuminating, but it is the most difficult. The, ch the important meanings of this sort, as may be seen from the example about the cat, are hard to isolate or to be sure of when you have done so. And there is a sort of meaning the sort people are thinking of when they say, this poet will mean more to you when you, ha when you have had more experience of life, which is hardly in reach of the analyst at all. They mean by this not so much that you will have more information, which could be given, uh, you, uh, could, which could be given at once, as that the information will have been uh, will have been digested, that you will be more experienced in the apprehension of verbal subtleties or of the poet's social tone, that you will have become the the sort of person that can feel at home in or imagine or extract experience from what is described by the poetry, that you will have included it among the things you are prepared to apprehend. There is a distinction here of the implied meanings of a sentence into what is to be assimilated at the moment and what must all be already, uh, which already be part of your habits. In arriving at the second of these, the educator, that mysterious figure, rather than the analyst, would be helpful. In a sense, it cannot be explained in language, because to a person who does not understand it in uh, does not understand it any statement of it. Because to a person who does not understand it, any statement of it is as difficult as the original one, while to a person who does understand it, a statement of it has no meaning because no purpose. Meanings of this kind indeed are conveyed, but they are conveyed much more by poets than by analysts. That that is what poets are for and why they are important. For poetry has powerful means of imposing its own assumptions and is very independent of the mental habits of the reader. One might trace its independence to the ease with which it can pass from the one to the other of these two sorts of meaning. A single word dropped where it comes most easily without being stressed and as if to fill out the sentence, may signal to the reader what he is meant to be taking for granted. If it is already in his mind, the word will seem natural enough and will not act as an unnecessary signal. Once it has gained its point on further readings, it will take for granted that you always took it for granted. Only very delicate people are as tactful in this manner as the printed page. Nearly all statements assume in this way that you know something, but not everything about the matter in hand, and would tell you something different if you knew more. But printed commonly differ from spoken ones in 
being intended for a greater variety of people and poetical form from prosaic ones in imposing the system of habits they imply more firmly or more quickly. As examples of the things that are taken for granted in this way and assume a habit, rather than a piece of information, in the reader one might give the fact that a particular section of the English language is being used. The fact that English is being used, which you can be conscious of if you can use French, the fact that a European language is used, which you can be conscious of if you, are, you, you can use Chinese. The first of these facts is more definite than it sounds. A word in a speech which falls outside the expected vocabulary will cause an uneasy stir in all but the soundest sleepers. Many sermons use this with painful frankness. Evidently, such a section is defined by its properties rather than by enumeration, and so alters the character of the words it includes. For instance, one would bear it in mind where cons uh, when considering whether the use of a word demands that one should consider its derivation. Regional or dialect poets are likely to use words flatly from that point of view. No single example of so delicate and continuous a matter can be striking. I shall take one at random out of the signed Deirdre to make a clear word need not be unpoetical merely because its meaning has been limited. Deirdre, it should be a sweet thing to have what is best and richest, if it's for a short space only. Nicey, and we've a short space only to be triumphant and brave. The language here seems rich in implications. It certainly carries much feeling and conveys a delicate sense of style. But if one thinks of the Roman or medieval associations of triumphant, even of its normal use in English, one feels a sort of unexplained warning that these are irrelevant. The word here is a thin counter standing for a notion not fully translated out of Irish. It is used to eke out that alien and sliding speech rhythm, which puts no weight upon its single words. The process of becoming accustomed to a new author is very much that of learning what to exclude in this way, and this first of the three facts, hard as it may be to explain in detail, is one with which appreciative critics are accustomed to deal very effectively. But the other two are more baffling. One can say little about the quality of a language, if only because the process of describing it in its own language is so top-heavy, and the words of another language will not describe it. The English prepositions, for, ex for example, from being used in so many ways and in combination with so many verbs, have acquired not so much a number of meanings as a body of meaning continuous in several dimensions a tool-like quality at once thin, easy to the hand, and weighty, which a mere statement of their variety does not convey. In a sense, all words have a body of this sort. None can be reduced to a finite number of points, and if they could, the points could not be conveyed by words. Thus a word may have several distinct meanings, several meanings connected with one another, several meanings which need one another to complete their meaning, or several meanings which unite together so that the word means one relation or one process. This is a scale which might be followed continuously. Ambiguity itself can mean an indecision as to what you mean, an intention to mean several things, a probability that one or other or both of two things has been meant, and the fact that a statement has several meanings. It is useful to be able to separate these if you wish, but it is not obvious that in separating them at any particular point uh, will not be raising more problems than you solve. Thus I shall often use the ambiguity of ambiguity and pronouns like one to make statements covering both reader and author of a poem, when I want to avoid raising irrelevant problems as to communication. 
to be less ambiguous would be to would be like analyzing the sentence about the cat into a course of anatomy. In the same way, the words of the poet will, as a rule, be more justly words. What they represent will be more effectively a unit in the mind than the more numerous words with which I shall imitate their meaning so as to show how it is conveyed. And behind this notion of the word itself as a solid tool rather than as a collection of meanings must be placed a notion of the way such a word is regarded as a member of the language. This seems still darker and less communicable in any terms but its own. For one may know what has been put into the pot and recognize the objects in the stew, but the juice in which they are sustained must be regarded with a peculiar respect because they are all in there too, somehow, and one does not know how they are com combined or held in suspension. One must feel the respect due to a profound lack of understanding for the notion of a potential and for the poet's sense of a, the nature of a language. These examples of the meanings of an English sentence should make clear that no explanation, certainly no explanation written in English, can be con conceived to list them completely, and that there may be implications, such as I could, uh, should call meanings, of, a, of which a statement would be no use. Neither of, uh, of these are objections to my purpose, because I can assume that my readers already understand and enjoy the examples I shall consider, and I am concerned only to conduct a sufficient analysis of their enjoyment to make it seem more understandable. It is possible that there are some writers who write very largely with this sense of a, of a language as such, so that their effects would be almost out of reach of analysis. Racine always seems to me to write with the whole weight of the French language to remind one always of the latent assumptions of French in a way that I am not competent to analyze in any case, but that very possibly could not be explained in intelligible terms. Dryden is a corresponding English figure in this matter. Miss Gertrude Stein, too, at this point, implores the passing tribute of a sigh. To understand their methods, one might have to learn a great deal about their, the mode of action of language, which is not yet known, and it might always be quicker to use habit than analysis, to learn the language than to follow the explanation. I propose then to consider a series of definite and detachable ambiguities in which several large and crude meanings can be separated out and to arrange them in order of increasing distance from simple statement and logical exposition. There is much danger of triviality in this because it requires a display of ingenuity such as can easily be used to escape from the consciousness of one's ignorance because it ignores the fact that the selection of meanings is more important to the poet than their multitude and harder to understand, and because it gives no means of telling how much has been done by meanings latent in the mode of action of the language, which may be far more elaborate and fundamental than those that can be written up. My methods can only be applied at intervals. I shall frequently pounce on the least interesting aspects of a poem as being large enough for my forceps, and the atoms which build up the compounds I analyze will always be more complex than they. But insofar as anything can be said about this mysterious and important matter, to say it ought not to require apology, I shall almost always take poems that I admire and write with pleasure about their merits. You might say that from the scientific point of view, this is a self-indulgence and that as much to be learnt from saying why bad poems are bad. This would be true if the field were of a known size. If you knew the ways in which a poem might be good, there would be a chance of seeing why it had failed. But in fact, you must rely on each particular poem to show you the way in which it is trying to be good. If it fails, you cannot know its object. 
and it would be trivial to explain why it had failed at something it was not trying to achieve. Of course, it may succeed in doing something that you understand and hate, and you may then explain your hatred. But all you can explain about the poem is its success. And even then, you can only have understood the poem by a stirring of the imagination, by something like an enjoyment of it from which you afterwards revolt in your own mind. Revolt in your own mind. It is, a, it is more self-centered, therefore, and so less reliable to write about the poems uh, you have thought bad than about the poems you have thought good. But before I start to do this, I must consider two fundamental objections to my purpose, which many critics would raise. The objection that the meaning of poetry does not matter because it is apprehended as pure sound, and the objection that what really matters about, the, about poetry is the atmosphere. These two opinions are very similar, but are best answered in different ways. The main argument for pure sound is the extreme oddity of the way poetry acts, the way lines seem beautiful without reason, the way you can decide, or at any rate, people in practice do decide, whether a poem deser deserves further attention by a mere glance at the way it uses its words. This certainly is an important piece of evidence and makes one feel that very strange things may be true about the mode of action in poetry, but it shows very little as to what these things may be. I shall myself try to bully my readers into a belief in the importance of ambiguity for just this same reason. There was a period of the cult of pure sound when infants were read passages from Homer and then questioned as to their impressions, and not unlike Darwin playing the trombone to his French beans. And indeed, conclusive evidence was collected in this way that a vague impression as to the subject of a poem may be derived from a, a study of its reciter. One can only question how far this is relevant to the question at issue. There is cr a crux here, to revive a rather stale controversy, which makes experiment difficult. On the one hand, it is no use telling a person who does not know Greek to read Homer for himself because he does not know how to pronounce it, even if he knows how to pronounce the words, he will not pronounce them as a sentence. On the other hand, if you tell him how to pronounce the sentence, it is impossible to be sure that uh, you, you have not told him how to feel about it by the tone of your voice. Certainly, it is no use denying that feelings can be conveyed, even between animals of different species, by grunts and screams. And there are those who say that language itself was at first a self-explanatory symbolism based on these expressions of feelings. Uh, on onomatopoeia, and on that use of the tongue to point at matters of interest or to imitate, and so define a difficult action, which may be seen as in a child learning to write. Certainly, too, one would expect language and poetry to retain its primitive uses more than elsewhere, but this sort of thing <coughs> is no use to the admirers of pure sound in poetry, because a grunt is at once too crude and too subtle to be conveyed by the alphabet at all. Any word can either be uh, can either screamed or grunt can be either screamed or grunted. So if you have merely a word written on paper, you have to know not only its meaning, but something about its context before it can tell you whether to grunt or scream. Most admirers of pure sound indeed will admit that you have to be experienced in the words used by a poet before their sound can be appreciated, and evidently this admission makes all the difference. They are the more willing to admit this because they are usually appreciative critics persons of an extreme delicacy of sensibility who have to guard this delicacy in unusual ways. A first-rate wine taster may only taste small amounts of wine for fear of disturbing his palate, 
and I dare say it would really be unwise for an appreciative critic to use his intelligence too fr freely. But there is no reason why these specialized habits should be imposed on the ordinary drinker or reader. Specialists usually have a strong trades union sense, and critics have been perhaps too willing to insist that the operation of poetry is something magical to which only their own method of incantation can be applied, or like the growth of a flower, which it could be folly to allow analysis to destroy by digging the roots up and crushing out the juices into the light of day. Critics, as barking dogs on this view, are of two sorts. Those who merely relieve themselves after the flower of beauty, and those less continent who afterwards scratch it up. I myself, I must confess, aspire to the second of these classes. Unexplained beauty arouses an irritation in me, a sense that this would be a good place to scratch. The reasons that make a line of verse likely to give pleasure, I believe, are like the reasons for anything else. One can reason about them, and while it may be true that the roots of beauty ought not to be violated, it seems to me very arrogant of the appreciative critic to think that he could do this if he chose by a little scratching. One reason, by the way, that the belief in pure sound is plausible seems interesting is that the people often test it by, experi um, by experiments within their own family of languages. They know, say, a novel reading about uh, uh, a novel reading amount of French, a public school amount of Latin, half forgotten and a smattering of Italian, and they try reading the Oxford book of Spanish verse and are impressed by the discovery that they can get a great deal of pleasure out of individual lines without understanding the meaning at all. Now, such poetry is in a tradition to which they are accustomed. They know roughly what to look for in the poetry of a Latin language. They know what the syntax connecting one or two large words is likely to be. And they are almost sure to know the root meaning, though not the precise meaning, of the one or two large words. It seems to be true with this equipment, one has a very fair chance of, of seeing what I may call the lyrical point of one or two lines. This may be an important piece of evidence about the mode of poetry, but as far as it concerns pure sounds, one must remember that such people will be pronouncing the lines entirely wrong. And Virgil remains the most melodious of poets uh, through all the vagaries of official pronunciation. Such points would be admitted by most reasonable people, and it may seem an invasion on my part to attack pure sound as a defense of the opposite fallacy of pure meaning. But the situation about pure sound is like that of about crude materialism. Both beliefs lead a sort of underground existence, and at a low level of organization have much vitality. Crude materialism is the first rough idea that people tumble into when they are interested in the sciences. In the same way, if you ask people in general about the interpretation of poetry, they are likely to say that it's no use talking because what they like is the sheer beauty of the sound. The official and correct view, I take it, is that the sound must be an echo to the sense, that we do not know what this condition may be, but, th uh, but that if we knew a great deal, it could be analyzed in detail. Thus, Latin. The stock line to try on the dog, tendibanque manius ripe ulterius amore, uh, the stock line to try on the dog, is beautiful because ulterioris, the word of their banishment, is long, and so shows that they have been waiting a long time, and because the repeated vowel sound, itself the moan of hopeless sorrow, in oris amore, connects the two words as if of their own natures, and makes desire belong necessarily to the unattainable. This I think quite true, 
but it is no use deducing from it Tennyson's simple and laborious cult of onomatopoeia. Once you abandon the idea that sounds are valuable in themselves, you are thrown far towards the other extreme. You must say that the sounds are valuable because they suggest incidental connections of meaning. If this be true, one can do a great deal to make poetry intelligible by discussing the variety of resultant meanings without committing oneself very deeply as to how they have been suggested by the sounds. In claiming so much for analysis, I shall seem to be aligning myself with a scientific mode of literary criticism, with psychological explanations of everything, and columns of a re reader's sensitivity coefficients. There is something, there is coming into existence a sort of party system among critics. Those critics will soon be considered mere shufflers who are not, not either only interested in truth or only interested in beauty and goodness. The third, and goodness, the third member of that indissoluble, indissoluble trinity has somehow got attached only to truth, so that aesthetic, aesthetes are expected to profess a playful indifference to the principles on which they in, f they in fact, one is to assume, order their own lives. It is odd and, I think, harmful that this fin de Cecile squabble is still going on. Somewhere in the 80s of the last century, the idea got about that physics and those sciences that might be conceived as derivatives of physics held a monopoly of reason. Aesthetes had therefore uh, to eschew reason. Now there are serious difficulties about applying the scientific view of truth to the arts. I shall attempt to restate them in my last chapter, but the belief that reason can be applied to the arts is as old as criticism and fundamental to it. There is no more materialism about it than there is about Aristotle. And if one is to be forced to take sides as a matter of mere personal venom, I must confess I find the crudity and latent fallacy of a psychologist discussing verses that he does not enjoy less disagreeable than the blurred and tasteless refusal to make t statements of an aesthete who convinces himself to be only interested in taste.